19th Amendment be ratified. That was very much uncertain. And um, we're going to look a little bit at how uh, Tennessee women helped prepare the path for the state to be the final state needed to ratify and make the 19th Amendment law. So for decades, women in Tennessee had been working on the right to vote. And one of the things they did was really contest negative stereotypes about suffragists and suffrage and get the message out about women needing the right to vote all throughout the state. So by 1919, um, historians have documented more than 70 suffrage leagues that were active throughout the state. So it was a statewide movement involving literally thousands of Tennessee women. And the suffrage leagues were really only part of the women involved in promoting women's right to vote. Um, so in the women's suffrage movement as a whole and in Tennessee, African-American women experienced a lot of marginalization. Many African-American women were very interested in the vote and they advocated for the right to vote within African American women's organizations. When we talk about suffrage leagues in Tennessee during this time of segregation, most of those organizations would have been organizations of white women, but that did not at all mean that African American women were not actively involved in the movement within Tennessee. Um, they just tended to work through their own organization. So, um, as far as thinking about um, women who supported suffrage in Tennessee, um, Tennessee suffragists really were among all the different spectrum of suffragist opinions on tactics. Um, Tennessee suffragists, most were fairly conservative regarding the strategies that they supported for the movement, but there were also some women who were National Women's Party uh, supporters in Tennessee. So there were lots of different perspectives, and that's one of the things that made the suffrage movement in Tennessee really interesting and really diverse. So Tennessee women actually had a very significant suffrage victory before 1920. Um, Tennessee women had worked for the passage of a presidential and municipal suffrage measure by the Tennessee General Assembly. So why were they interested in that? One, that was an approved strategy by the largest uh, women's suffrage organization nationally at the time, the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Um, they supported women trying to get the right to vote in their state in this way. Um, and because of the Tennessee Constitution, which is very hard to amend, um, the legislature could pass a regular bill granting Tennessee women um, the right to vote in municipal and presidential elections, but for women to vote in state elections, it would actually have taken an amendment to the state constitution. So um, women, were active in advocating for a presidential and municipal suffrage. It was up for a consideration in 1917. During that legislative session, it did not pass. But in 1919, the, general, the, the Tennessee General Assembly did vote to approve presidential and municipal suffrage for Tennessee women. And they thought this was great. This was a really important step forward and they actively went to work with voting after that passed. And one of the really interesting things with um, the Tennessee elections occurring in 1919 was cooperation we see between African American women voters and white women voters, especially in Nashville. Um, uh, Frankie Juno Pierce, shown here, 
Um, she was a very important African American suffragist in Nashville, and she worked with white suffragists like Catherine Kenny um, to help support a reform slate of candidates in Nashville. And um, actually, about 2,500 African American women registered to vote in Nashville in that 1919 municipal election. And throughout the state, African American women registered to vote in 1919 for their municipal elections. And um, the candidates supported by um, these efforts, by these um, interracial efforts in Nashville, that slate of candidates won in 1919. So there was already some early evidence of the power of women voting and how they could affect election in Tennessee. Okay, so it was actually a surprise that Tennessee became such a critical state in the 19th Amendment's ratification. This was not expected by Tennessee suffragists. They were really excited about having won presidential and municipal suffrage. And um, in 1920, they actually had a convention in which they started the transition between a statewide suffrage organization to a League of Women Voters organization in Tennessee. Um, there was a provision in Tennessee's constitution that prohibited members of the General Assembly who had been elected after a federal constitutional amendment was referred to the state from voting on that amendment. And so basically, if that provision had held, um, only legislators who were elected to the General Assembly after November 1919, after that election, would have been allowed to vote on the 19th Amendment's ratification. But the U.S. Supreme Court had some decisions that overturned state rules that infringed upon uh, basically the rules set forth in the U.S. Constitution for the ratification of amendments. So that basically meant that Tennessee's constitutional prohibition on this particular group of legislators voting to ratify in the summer of 1920, um, it was declared unconstitutional um, along with um, some similar provisions in other states. So, surprise, Tennessee becomes the key state in um, this suffrage battle. And so, what was going on in the summer of 1920? And why did Tennessee become so critical? So, after Delaware rejected ratification on June 2nd, there were only five states left who hadn't voted on the amendment's ratification. And those were Connecticut, Vermont, North Carolina, Florida, and Tennessee. And the governors in Connecticut and Vermont, who were both anti-suffrage, basically had refused to call a special session. And the legislatures in Florida and North Carolina declined to vote on it at that time which was essentially a no vote. Um, so it really did come down to Tennessee. And in the summer of 1920, it was not a sure thing that the 19th Amendment was going to be ratified. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, um, she writes later in, in some historical works that she produced about the suffrage movement that people were really anxious and that um, women who had not been involved in the suffrage movement previously were getting really interested in having the vote. And there was a lot of frustration. The presidential election was coming up as well as many state and local elections in November, 1920. And the big question was, would women get to vote, right? And that was not a sure thing at all. Even though both 
major political parties had already started trying to attract the support of women voters, it just was not clear that the 19th Amendment would really be ratified. So, um, Catherine Kenny is in Nashville in June, and um, uh, the governor uh, expresses willingness to call a special session under certain uh, provisions, right, especially waiting until after the Democratic primary occurs. Um, but Catherine Kenny is, is there in Nashville, and she's getting letters from Carrie Chapman Cat, and um, not all the uh, Tennessee suffrage leaders are in the state at that time. Some of them are out of state. But Catherine Kenny goes to work organizing women in Tennessee for the big ratification effort. And um, she is very much in contact with national suffrage leaders, and uh, she's working hard to um, really have women throughout the state be involved in this effort because that's what it's going to take for it to pass. So the legislature at this point is not in session. They will not go into special session until later in August, right? So um, women in the summer of 1920 in Tennessee throughout the state, they're visiting their legislators at their homes, in their community. Um, legislators are being asked to sign pledges. Will they vote to ratify? Will they not? And the suffragists are counting their votes. And um, those uh, pledge records are, uh, many of them available in the Carrie Chapman Cat papers at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. So you can see where they were uh, working very diligently to promote the suffrage cause in Tennessee. Um, and a lot of work was going on before that special session. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, did come to Nashville. She uh, made her headquarters at the Hermitage Hotel, and she did travel around the state some during this lead up to the ratification. But interestingly, um, she focused on strategy, working with Tennessee suffragists, working with Tennessee political leaders in the ratification effort. She did not attend the legislative session at the Capitol. Um, she knew she was not a Tennessean, and she did not think that was where she needed to be. So uh, there were a lot of Tennessee suffragists in the galleries in the Senate and the House during the ratification vote, but Carrie Chapman Cat stayed at the Hermitage Hotel and remained kind of behind the scenes, but she was very active, um, certainly in the ratification effort. Um, the National Woman's Party was also represented in Tennessee during the ratification movement. Um, uh, and Sue Shelton White was very important in that, and she was from Tennessee. Um, she had been a suffragist in Jackson for many years, a leader in local and state suffrage organizations. She had originally been affiliated with groups associated with the more conservative um, National, uh, National American Woman Suffrage Association, but she actually broke with them over um, issues of National Women's Party speakers having the right to speak in Tennessee communities. And um, she was very much an advocate for free speech and for their ability to speak publicly. And there was a parting of the ways on that. Um, and she became very active in the National Women's Party and was actually arrested and jailed for some of her protest activities in Washington, D.C. Um, so she comes back to Tennessee to help with the ratification battle. So the amendment is ratified. How did this happen? And um, then what were sort of the next steps? Thanks to the efforts of Tennessee suffragists, um, who worked diligently with senators 
to advocate for the ratification. Um, it, it passes easily in the Senate, which the, the Senate had traditionally been the House of the Legislature where uh, suffrage measures had the most uh, opposition. That was not the case with the 19th Amendment ratification. The battle was really in the House where it was really close. There were heated debates, um, and it, it was really uncertain how the House would finally vote. And it came down to August 18, 1920, when the House narrowly voted to approve the 19th Amendment. And a, during that, a critical vote was cast by Harry T. Byrne, a young representative from um, McMinn County, who was very much influenced by his mother, who encouraged him to support women's right to vote, and he did. And he faced a lot of criticism for that vote, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we look at the November 1920 election. Um, so there was this great victory. But that's not the end of Tennessee's ratification story at all. There was an almost immediate backlash against the legislators' favorable vote on the 19th Amendment. Um, the Speaker of the House, who was an anti-suffragist, Seth Turner, actually changed his vote to um, in favor of the amendment's ratification so that he could call for reconsideration of the amendment at a later date. Some of the anti-suffragist legislators fled to Alabama to prevent a quorum. Um, there were indignation meetings throughout the state. So continued um, legislative battle and illegal actions in the courts ensued. But Tennessee's ratification vote held, and the 19th Amendment was ratified. So, then there was the question of what will women do with their vote? And this was really not clear. Um, male political leaders were very concerned um, about women voters. They feared that women would not have the same kinds of party loyalty to the major political party that um, they were used to male voters having. They thought it was more likely women might vote on issues rather than party affiliation, and that was very unsettling. And women voters were really seen as potentially decisive in elections in general, and particularly in the November 1920 election. And uh, we'll talk about how uh, the behavior of women voters demonstrated that they did care what politicians' views were on suffrage. They remembered when it came time to vote in 1920. So let's look at this um, passage from the Kingsport Times, published on September 28, 1920. So this reflects the concerns of political leaders about how would women vote. And the Kingsport Times reported, it is said that women suffrage leaders have a complete record of everything a congressman or senator has ever said about suffrage. From many quarters come dark rumors that this evidence will mean the political ruin of the opposition statesmen. So there were a lot of worried political leaders who were up for election in 1920. Joe Burns was one of them. So he was a candidate for the Tennessee House in November 1920, and he had openly opposed women's suffrage, and now he faces the task of trying to appeal to women voters. So in this passage, he's talking about, uh, he admits he opposed suffrage, but he tells women that basically they have to vote in self-defense, and he trusts that they will vote wisely and well. And um, so it, it's really interesting to see how um, politicians running for election who had opposed suffrage then try to appeal to women voters. And um, Joe Burns was a candidate from Montgomery County in Tennessee. 
So let's look at Harry T. Burns' re-election campaign in 1920. So his vote in favor of the 19th Amendment's ratification made him a target for anti-suffragists who did not go away and did not give up. They basically worked for the defeat of candidates who had supported ratification. So um, Henry Byrne was facing a lot of opposition in his reelection campaign in 1920. Um, and as I said, the suffragists remembered who helped them. So Harry T. Byrne was a Republican. Democratic suffragists like Abby Crawford Milton went to his district and helped organize Democratic women to support Harry T. Burns. And he won re-election. The suffragists did not forget. And they helped turn out women voters, even women voters from other parties, to support uh, candidates who had supported them. Now, we get to the election of 1920 in November. And the votes are counted. And there's some unexpected results. So just to give a little context for this, in the late 1800s and early 1900s in Tennessee, Tennessee was basically um, majority Democratic. Um, but that was not true uniformly throughout the state. In some areas, the Republican Party was very strong. And these tended to be areas that had had a lot of unionist support during the Civil War. And that's true especially of East Tennessee, but also in counties like Henderson County in West Tennessee. Um, a lot of Republican candidates from Henderson County achieved success during this period. So Republican candidates were very competitive in many local elections. And they could definitely win state elections, especially when the Democratic uh, voters were divided. And that was the case in 1920. Governor Roberts had made a lot of enemies, right? And it wasn't just his support for the 19th Amendment's ratification. He had angered farmers. He had angered um, industrial workers through some of his policies. So he had a lot of opposition. And in the 1920 election, um, Tennessee voters chose Republican Alfred Taylor for governor, and Tennessee uh, had a majority for the Republican presidential candidate that year, Warren G. Hardy. Um, so you get uh, newspaper articles like this one that appeared in the Lexington Progress. And notice how the editor here um, is blaming the defeat of Democrats in Tennessee on women's suffrage. And uh, when he talks about here, um, when he refers to Southern men being given back the ballot, um, that particularly refers to basically white Southern men with pro-Confederate sympathy, right? He's referring to specific Southern men. But the editor here is particularly calling out a suffragists and their supporters for um, breaking the solid South, so all the South didn't go Democratic, and for Democratic lawsuits in Tennessee. And suffragists were very aware of this situation. So Catherine Kenny wrote that her Tennessee sister suff suffragists have had to run a daily gauntlet of I told you so and the women did it. Now, uh, Kenny was a Democrat, as were many of the suffragists, right? So they were felt like they were being blamed by uh, Democratic political leaders within the state for a Democratic lawsuit. So let's talk a bit about how women gaining the right to vote brought about change in the culture of politics and voting. So 
what happened when um, women got the right to vote? They went from being individuals who could only basically ask for political leaders to support um, initiatives they were interested in to being constituents who could demand change because they were voters, right? And that's gonna have a big impact on women's status in political life. So, um, Abby Crawford Milton, who was the last president of the statewide uh, Tennessee Women's Suffrage Organization and the first president of the Tennessee League of Women Voters, is writing here to Carrie Chapman Catt about um, citizenship schools that they're organizing to basically train voters. So I, I notice how she mentions evening programs for working women who can't attend during the day because of their job and that no fee is to be charged for women who want to come to this citizenship training. So um, women suffragists in Tennessee, some of them transition to really being advocates for women voters. And we see this in this quote here. Now, um, voting and polling places, that had very much been the province of men. And a lot of changes were gonna have to take place for um, women to really be uh, uh, comfortable in some of these spaces and going to vote. And I really like this quote because it touches upon some of those issues. Basically, a lot of polling places um, had uh, activities going on, like tobacco, smoking, spitting, drinking, even though that was prohibited by law that went on, swearing, fights. Um, lots of things that women voters, especially women voters bringing their children with them to vote, would not feel comfortable. And um, this Tennessee woman is pointing out that men would like it if they had to vote in a female space and that basically there needed to be some changes. Um, and uh, there were. So women voters were able to ask for and demand a changes in um, conditions at the polling places and expectations for appropriate behavior at these sites. Um, this is when you see a lot of polling places get moved to school. So I want to show you some photographs of um, sort of voting before and after the 19th Amendment. And um, I'll say one thing we've discovered is that it's kind of hard to find pictures of polling places. So um, I'll ask for you to bear with me with these examples. So here's a polling place before the 19th Amendment. And this is actually a white county in Tennessee about 1901. And you'll notice all the people there are males, including male children. Um, so here's a scene from election day in 1922. And this is a more general picture from the Library of Congress. And notice lots of women there and see the lady holding the infant, right? So women were coming to vote with their children. So a very different kind of atmosphere after women get the right to vote and the 19th Amendment is ratified. Another thing that really starts to change with political culture is increasing numbers of women start to run for elected offices, even very early after the ratification. So here is a quote from Jesse McCall who ran for register in Henderson County in 1921. And um, she publishes an appeal to voters in the newspaper in which she states, quote, I am not asking that you vote for me just because I am a woman, but I do not think that you should vote against me for that same reason. The question is, can I and will I honorably perform the duties of the office? She's pointing out it's the person's qualifications and their capabilities that matter, not their gender. And this is 1921. So that's very significant. We see um, women gaining um, election to um, offices. Um, this image shows U.S. Representative 
Willa McCord Blaise Exit, who served in Congress. Uh, representing a Tennessee from 1932 to 1933. Another great example of women gaining elected offices is Anne Lee Worley of Bluff City. So um, she was elected to fill her deceased husband's Tennessee Senate seat um, very soon after the 19th Amendment's ratification. And this is kind of ironic because her husband was an outspoken anti-suffragist. So he is succeeded in office by his wife, and she proceeds to sponsor legislation in the Tennessee Senate to remove all legal barriers in Tennessee to women serving in elected government offices. And that measure is successful. So um, even early on, um, Tennessee women elected officials are having important impact. And just running for office is also a new sign of really women's change status because of gaining the right to vote. So the 19th Amendment is really not at all the end of the story of women's rights. It's really the beginning of a new chapter. So we're gonna look at some ways that um, women continue the struggle for voting rights after the 19th Amendment. So African-American women continue to face a lot of barriers to voting. So especially in the 1890s, in many Southern states like Tennessee, political leaders passed laws that were designed to disenfranchise African-American male voters, like poll taxes and other uh, measures. And uh, the effect of these laws was to keep a lot of African-American men from voting and a lot of white men who were not wealthy from voting as well. And African-American women, when they went to vote, which many African-American women wanted to vote and tried to register, um, they encountered the same difficulties that were being experienced by African-American men and also faced intimidation and the threat of violence. But that did not stop a lot of African-American women in Tennessee from pushing for the vote. Um, the lady uh, shown in this photograph, Mary Ellen Vaughn, was a newspaper owner and editor in Murfreesboro and a civil rights advocate. And um, you see women throughout Tennessee, African-American women who are trying to exercise their right to vote in the 1920s. And I want to um, mention the research by one of, our one of my colleagues that will be featured in our ratified exhibit. So um, Debbie Shaw, who's one of the curators and part of our exhibit team, she did some research focusing on poll tax records and was able to uncover some of the stories of African-American women voting in Tennessee. Um, counties tended to keep um, poll tax records and they no would note an individual's gender and race in many cases. So looking at, that rec at those records provides clues to women's activities. And it was so exciting to see these African-American women um, in these poll tax records because of all the barriers that they were facing. So that's something to look forward to. And I encourage everyone to visit our ratified exhibit after it opens, um, uh, hopefully soon. Um, here is a quote from um, Ms. Vaughn's newspaper, the Murfreesboro Union. And Nanny H. Burroughs was a leader in African-American women's organization. And in this statement, she is drawing connections between enforcement of the 19th Amendment and enforcement of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship for African-Americans, and the 15th Amendment, which ensured African-American men's right to vote. And she's basically saying all these amendments, all these measures are connected. And that's a really important 
statement. And African American women in Tennessee will continue to resist and fight against efforts to keep them from voting. Um, Asian American women also continue to struggle for the right to vote. Um, they did not receive the right to vote under the 19th Amendment because uh, most Asian Americans at the time in 1920 were prevented from becoming American citizens. So that did not change until considerably later, really into the 1950s, when um, laws were passed and court rulings ensured Asian American women's right to become citizens and then to vote. Native American women also struggled for the right to vote. They did not automatically receive the right to vote under the 19th Amendment because most, most Native American women at the time were not citizens. And it was actually not until 1962 that um, the last group of Native American women were enfranchised um, because after they gained the right to vote and citizenship nationally, uh, then they encountered a lot of laws in different states that prevented them from voting. So Utah was actually the last state that began to allow Native American women to vote in 1962. So I wanted to talk a bit more about poll taxes. So poll taxes were a fee required to be paid in order to vote. And as opposed to other kinds of taxes, um, no uh, local official or state official or national official was going to come after somebody if they didn't pay their poll taxes. Basically, the only consequence was you couldn't vote. They were designed to keep people from voting. And at first, Tennessee women were not required to pay poll taxes. That changed in 1922. And we see a dramatic decline in Tennessee women voting in the 1922 election. And I want to share with you this quote from Sue Shelton White, which speaks to this issue. And um, she is very much saying here um, two things. One, um, there's still a lot of resistance among men to women voting and for women being told that it's not their place to vote, even though constitutionally they have that right. And also women oftentimes did not control the financial means to pay their poll taxes. So women who had to depend on their fathers or their husbands for the money to pay their poll taxes, um, if, if those men didn't think their uh, female relatives should vote, that was the problem. They might not be able to pay their poll taxes. So it's like the the culture of whether or not women should vote, it was a big step forward with the 19th Amendment, but there was resistance still out there um, that women faced on a lot of fronts. So um, that was just sort of the beginning of a new story. However, I want to emphasize that that doesn't mean that the 19th Amendment wasn't important. It was, it was extremely important. And um, on this slide, you can see a state Senate campaign poster for Abby Crawford Milton, who had been a suffrage leader in Tennessee. And here in the 1930s, we see her running for the state Senate. So um, the 19th Amendment was very important. Um, it, that does not mean it resolved all the issues about women's right to vote, it did not, but it did fundamentally change women's status in American political life from being um, basically not really officially included to being constituents who helped decide who got elected. And, and that was very powerful. And political leaders took notice of that. 
because they had to. Um, so being a voter really matters. And this impacted women's opportunities and their roles and their communities. So uh, getting back to our question for the evening, um, the 1920s really was a decade of change for women. And women gaining the right to vote in the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, that really was part of um, a lot of changes going on in the 1920s with trends towards urbanization, more women entering the workplace, and uh, debates about changing cultural standards and women's roles. Um, women's right to vote was central to those debates, and it was a really critical part of those changes. Um, and I want to say again, thank you to our audience. I so appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I'm pleased to talk to you about them. Please uh, feel free to share them with our staff in the uh, chat feature. And I also wanted to, just in case um, I'm not able to answer your question this evening, or if something occurs to you later uh, that you'd like to ask, um, please feel free to contact me. Here's my email address, and I am here to help. Um, that's my job, and I will be pleased to try to assist you. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear from you. And uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I, I see Rachel. Um, is ready to help with the question. Yes, thank you, Miranda. That was wonderful. Uh, we got a couple of questions about the poll tax. How much approximately would it have been and how much would that maybe equate to today? Sure. Um, it was about $2 in a lot of Tennessee counties in 1920 per voter. Um, I, I would be afraid to try to equate that in today's money. And I'll explain sort of the reason why. Um, you know, in 1920, Tennessee was still very much a rural state. And a lot of farm families didn't see very much cash money um, during the year. So $2 was a lot of money. That, that was a significant investment for many Tennesseans at the time. So um, somebody else asked, when was the poll tax discontinued? Um, yes, it was actually outlawed um, by a, a amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and that was not outlawed until the 24th Amendment, which was ratified in 1964. Awesome. Uh, what is your favorite artifact, suffered artifact in the ratified exhibit? Do you have a favorite? Well, it's a hard choice, but I would probably say our suffrage banners, which too have been recently conserved um, for a display in the exhibit. And it was really wonderful to get to um, promote those artifacts, continued well-being. And um, they, I think, are so important because they were important to the suffragists. They really saw them as a representation of their cause. And um, there, there's this really interesting uh, story. In one of the Tennessee counties, their suffrage league won a, a prize in their town's 4th of July parade. And they used their $50 prize money to join the state suffrage association and to work towards getting the banner. So those banners were really important to suffragists. So I, I would say that's my favorite artifact. That's a great choice. We got two really specific questions. I think this was in the section right before you talked about um, African American women. But one question is, did Jesse end up winning the position of registrar? No, she did not. Um, I, and there's some really interesting articles in the Lexington Progress afterwards. Um, and I'll say it was quite significant that her appeal to voters was published because the um, editor of that paper was a notorious anti-suffragist and um, really did not become resigned to women voting for a while. 
after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So it was pretty remarkable, you know, that he was willing to publicize her campaign in 1921. That's awesome. And right after that, in that same section, somebody asked for clarification, was the name Ann Lee Wardy? And this- um, Worley? Worley. Uh-huh. Okay, I mean, perfect. It's, def- it's W-O-R-E-L-E-Y. Perfect, thank you. And then I think, oh, here we go. We got one more. I was gonna say we're done. Was the Tennessee Constitution amended to allow women to vote in state elections? Uh, no. Basically, um, the state constitution, um, it was not amended because the federal constitution um, supersedes state constitutions. Um, uh, but suffragists actually pushed for a, con- a state constitutional amendment for a little while, but it pretty quickly became clear that strategy wasn't going to work just because it was really hard to amend the state constitution. So um, that's why they started pressing for um, partial suffrage and then um, really supported the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Awesome. Um, Somebody else asked, where are good resources, books? Are there any in our museum store or any that you'd recommend? Um, Yes, there are many wonderful resources out there. Um, I am certain that um, our store manager has some featured. There's some books that are specifically about um, the suffrage movement in Tennessee. Um, And I really love the older primary sources, um, like the History of Woman Suffrage, which was published by the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And there's a really interesting account for Tennessee in that volume that covers 1920, um, because it, one of the things it does is there, there are actually two accounts, because for, from 1914 to 1918, there were two competing state suffrage associations. So um, they fought for their representatives to each be able to include their own history and uh, this um, a national uh, suffrage history, and they won. So if you look at that, there are actually two uh, suffrage accounts. And uh, Catherine Kenny, in her account in that book, she specifically references the uh, cooperative efforts between African American suffragists and white suffragists in the election in 1919. Wonderful. Uh, when was a woman finally elected to the Tennessee legislature on her own? Actually, very early. Um, Ann Lee Worley was very soon after um, ratification. Um, there was another a woman um, from Shelby County who was elected in the early 1920s. So there were women who were serving in the Tennessee legislature during the 1920s. Wonderful. I think that's the end of our time and the end of our questions, which is perfect, Miranda. Thank you. Uh, I did want to remind everybody, even though this class series is over, you can go back and watch them on YouTube. Um, You can also see some awesome Lunch with a Curator programs on there. We had one about uh, the first female printer in Tennessee, who was uh, the first woman to be elected to state office um, as the state printer. So some cool stuff to go back and watch. And we have more digital programming coming in July, uh, even though the museum is reopening. So check out our reopening plans. You can see all the stuff about it, uh, but we're opening in July and hopefully you can come visit us in person as well. Um, I believe that's it. Miranda, thank you so much for guiding us through this whole series. And everybody, please have a great night and hopefully we'll see you in person soon. All right, bye-bye.